uh, Intrepid Control Systems, just as a way of introduction, is a uh, supplier of uh, vehicle network tools. So we've been involved with CAN, CANFD, LIN. Uh, the hot topics these days are a lot of new things with automotive Ethernet, CERTES technologies. And uh, this presentation is going to try to uh, just kind of say, uh, just, just explain what's happening as an overview in the industry uh, from a vehicle network standpoint, uh, what's happening for future network architectures and why. Uh, so the company, what, uh, what, what, what we do is we sell vehicle network tools, interfaces, uh, data loggers. Uh, so we won't spend a lot of time on that. Just wanted to introduce the company and a little bit about the products. Um, that's what we're here for is to sell products. That's how we make our money. Now, if you've been in uh, vehicle networking like we have for uh, more than 30 years, um, there's always uh, certain times where you know, every 10 years, every 15 years, there's a big change in, in networking. So we saw it when, when CAN came in in the early 90s and the 2000s, that time frame, we had controller area network. And, and then uh, we went to all types of other, uh, another big change was automotive Ethernet being introduced. And we're, we're really at the edge now of uh, new technology that's coming out that's going to change a lot of how testing's done, how development's done, uh, and it's called uh, zonal architectures. So what we have now with vehicle networks is uh, generally uh, referred to as a domain architecture uh, with the vehicle network. That means essentially you have one network and ECUs, so, you know, a, a group of ECUs that are dedicated to a particular function in the vehicle. So for example, an obvious one would be powertrain. You have a set of ECUs and they're networked together uh, normally over CANFD or FlexRay that serve the purpose of uh, the propulsion of the vehicle. And then a separate network, physically separate, would be, uh, for example, uh, uh, heating and cooling. And another one might be lighting. Another one might be body. And so what, what we've done over the past 20 years with this domain architecture, that is defining networks and ECUs based on the function of the vehicle, um, it, it served the industry well, but, but, but where we're at now is essentially what we've done is we've taken a vehicle network like a powertrain that stretches across the whole vehicle, the wiring for example, and we put on top of it a, a different network for a different function like HVAC, it stretches across most of the vehicle, lighting, another network, and so what we've done is we've stacked these networks on top and on top of each other, and the end result is, uh, that you can see on this uh, slide, is we have many redundant wiring that's going across the entire vehicle. And it, increases the complexity of the wiring harness by a lot, a lot of weight, and this leads to, uh, specifically the complexity of the wiring harness with lots of connectors, uh, leads to a lot of weight and also quality problems in the field. And even wiring harnesses these days, uh, even, even today, 2023, are uh, made by hand. There's still not an automated process for that. So uh, they're very expensive it, uh, and they, they weigh a lot. And so this is one reason why uh, there, there's a new paradigm that's come out, and that's, that is, we're going to group the electronic functions in the vehicle not, and, and the networks not based on function, not based on their function in the vehicle, but rather based on where do the actuators and sensors, where does the electronics need to be? Where's the location of the actuators and sensors? So that's where we get zonal, meaning zonal literally meaning the location in the vehicle where the actuators and sensors need to be located. And uh, essentially what we're going to do is, is we're going to group, we're going to group uh, ECUs together, uh, again, based on their location, and, and network them all together. Uh, and what this does is uh, it essentially reduces the complexity of the wiring by an order of magnitude. And essentially we have uh, what we call, we, we, we divide the vehicle up into different zones, hence the name zonal architecture, and we take all of the data, uh, the, the, network, the networks and the ECUs uh, are going to be connected together within a zone, and then we have a, a relatively complicated, expensive ECU in the zone, in a specific zone, so we might have, this represents six, uh, six zonal controllers, and so we'll call them zonal controllers, that aggregate all the data to and from the sensors. And then the zonal controllers then are networked together to uh, what we'll call a central processing unit, a central brain. And uh, the central brain then is where we're gonna try to make most of the decisions in the vehicle. So the, the paradigm is not just a change in 
how we organize the network, it's a paradigm in where is the intelligence of the vehicle. So, uh, so what we're doing is not only changing the wiring and so forth, we're also modifying, we're taking what used to be intelligence in a, in a large number of ECUs, we're reducing the number of, of ECUs that have intelligence, and we're putting as much intelligence as possible inside of the central processing unit. Now, what that does provides even a bigger benefit of zonal architecture. The biggest benefit of zonal architecture is not the wiring harness, that's one big benefit, but even a bigger benefit is this is the best type of platform for what we call a software-defined vehicle. Because essentially what happens in this type of architecture, you have a central processing unit that does as many decisions as possible in the vehicle, and that means you just have one hardware, one set of software running in one hardware that you have to maintain and control for uh, software updates, for example. So in this architecture, it's a lot easier to maintain and update one large ECU compared to, let's say, 90 or 50 to 90 uh, independent ECUs from different suppliers and different uh, code bases, for example. So this platform has two big advantages, and uh, it's, it's, the, it's the reduction of complexity of the wiring harness, uh, but even bigger is this is, the, this is if you hear the, the term software-defined vehicle, this is the platform that, uh, this is the architecture that all OEMs are moving towards. So this is already something that most large OEMs are already moving towards, uh, but, and it's a big shift in paradigm. So here's another sort of schematic view of what's happening. This is a domain architecture where we have uh, separated ECUs and networks based on function in the vehicle. This is the domain architecture. And this is what a zonal architecture might look like, uh, where you have groups, uh, clusters of ECUs going to a zonal controller. The zonal controller aggregates the data to and from the uh, ECUs and actuators, and everything goes to the central computer. As much, uh, as much decision making is made in the central compute as possible. Now, another result of this new architecture is that the, um, you'll see at, at what we call the edge nodes, on the edge nodes, these devices, as much as possible, become just sensors and actuators, sort of dumb sensors and actuators. They don't make decisions, they're not making controlled decisions by themselves. Uh, so we, again, like we said, we want all the control decisions to be made in the central compute module. So in a, in a zonal architecture, we have a central compute making most of the decisions. The I.O. goes all over a high-speed network to a zonal controller. The zonal controller has the job of aggregating and unpacking uh, the uh, I.O. going to and from the actuators and sensors. And essentially, the uh, edge nodes then become as, just sen you know, as, as much as possible dumb sensors and actuators. So reducing the number of ECUs in the vehicle, reducing the uh, wiring harness complexity, and most importantly, this is the easiest and best platform for a software-defined vehicle. So zonal architecture is already what almost every major OEM, global OEMs uh, that, that sell in, in the Western market are all driving towards zonal architecture. So it's something that we, we all have to be uh, aware of and be ready for uh, as, as uh, development and test engineers. Now, Relative to um, uh, the zonal architecture, just a few years ago wasn't possible to be done. And there's been a lot of developments in networking technology that makes this type of architecture possible. First and foremost is just various forms of automotive ethernet. So we're gonna see in the future a much more dependence on automotive ethernet than what we've seen in the past. And automotive ethernet has speed grades all the way down at the low end from 10 megabits per second all the way at the high end uh, that's available today, 10 gigabits per second. So we got a whole range of speed grades, uh, 10 megabits, 100 megabit, uh, gigabit ethernet, and then 2.5, 5, and 10 gigabits. So that's available today. And then there's also uh, people working on the uh, 25 gigabit as well. So, so we have a large range of speed grades for automotive ethernet, and that enables the uh, high speed data that's going to need to be able to be between the zones. So between the zones and the central compute module, we're going to see a lot more data on networks than what we see today with the domain-based uh, architecture. 
because all of the I.O. control and all of this uh, um, input and output has to go through the network now, whereas in the past it didn't need to do that. Other uh, advances in technology include uh, AutoZar. AutoZar's uh, main purpose, whether it's classic AutoZar um, or um, uh, whether um, it's um, classic or adaptive AutoZar, is designed to enable multiple vendors of software to coexist inside of an ECU. That's one of the main things that AutoZar provides. And if you think about the central compute module, what we're talking about here is having HVAC software, body control software, all types of software, uh, even infotainment software running inside of the same ECU. And so naturally AutoZar is the um, natural uh, system that gives you the ability to do that. Uh, we also have with automotive ethernet um, defined functionality through a, a group called Open Alliance for power management. This enables uh, the ethernet networks to go to sleep in low power mode, wake up, uh, which is also an essential component of automotive networking. Uh, there's lots of um, other technologies that I won't have time to go into, but uh, time synchronization is one that's fundamental as well, 802.1AS, which enables all ECUs on an automotive network, automotive ethernet network to be time synchronized uh, to the accuracy of less than one microsecond. And since we're talking about high speed grades, we also have very low latencies on these networks as well, compared to what we have on uh, KNFD and FlexRay today. ADAS functionality, but Spe specifically when we talk about network and ADAS functionality, uh, there's, there's different um, things that we need to support. And uh, the, um, one, of the, one of the top things is essentially radars, LIDARs, and cameras, and cameras being uh, the, the devices that require the highest bandwidth. Uh, cameras are uh, essentially uh, you know, one, of the, one of the main sensors that's used for uh, any type of autonomous or ADAS uh, vehicle, and um, the capture of video data and the transport of that video data to a central brain unit requires very high bandwidth. And one reason is because the capture of the video data has to be, it has to be transported uncompressed to the, to the central, whatever unit's going to uh, consume that data. It has to be uncompressed because as soon as we introduce compression, uh, it means that you're going to add a latency. And, and compression, even depending, dependent on the data, uh, can be a, a variable latency. So that's something that's unacceptable for uh, safety critical real-time uh, con control applications. And so for, for cameras and autonomous applications, mostly what we see is uh, uncompressed uh, video data. And cameras typically uh, range in, uh, one camera can range in you know, five gigabits all the way to 10 gigabit speeds uh, output of the, uh, of, the, of the video data. So what transports the data with cameras is CERDES, something called ser uh, serializers and deserializers. There's uh, several forms of it now uh, that are on the market and have been on the market a long time. FPD Link from Texas Instruments, GMSL2 from uh, ADI, it's a different, different company now that bought them, bought Maxim, uh, so analog devices, and then Sony has GVIF. But the general idea of uh, CERDES uh, technologies is that you have a, a device, let's just say it's a camera, and we have a very high speed uh, data going in one direction and then essentially just low speed in one direction. So the difference between uh, CERTES technologies and most other technologies is that it's asymmetric, meaning that the data flow is high speed in one direction but very, very relatively low speed in the other direction. Um, so, so that's something that affects the network and the CERTES technology is only a point to point type of network either. You can only have one device connected to one other device. Now when we say the domain to zonal transition, I mentioned already that every major OEM is moving away from domains to the zonal, specifically so that they become a, a more of a software-defined vehicle, software-defined vehicle, software-defined company, and so forth. So that's a big push uh, at the uh, high level uh, in, within companies. Now this transition is not gonna happen all in one step. So what's happening now is that this transition from domain to full zonal is, is complicated because, for example, if we wanted to do a full zonal controller including autonomous or ADAS functionality, that's a huge step and that's very dangerous. So what we see most OEMs doing is that ADAS and autonomous functionality, one way or the other, you can see in this picture, it stays separate or is part of the central compute module. 
It either is a separate ECU or it's built in as a separate set of functionality inside of the central compute module. But the data, to have this high speed data, the CERDES data, that's gigabit data on top of the network is too much to do all in one step. And so what we see is as OEMs were saying, okay, we'll put, we'll put zonal control functionality for HVAC, body control, lighting, things that are simple, things that are not safety critical, and the next step will be we're going to add more stuff uh, you know, over years of time. And this might take uh, a decade or more, but the essential idea now is that uh, zonal control functionality or zonal, zonal architecture is something that is happening. Every OEM is moving towards it uh, to varying degrees of um, you know, aggressiveness. So as I mentioned, uh, the central compute module, we just look at that with a zonal controller and ADAS or autonomous functionality, we, what we see is two, one of two different things where uh, the ADAS is built into the central compute module and then we have the cameras, radar, LIDAR, and other ECUs going right into an ADAS module or the ADAS can be uh, completely separate, but it's not built into the zone architecture itself. And, and the reason is, is, is um, these cameras with high speed uh, require really high speed data. If we want to mix this really high speed data that also is safety critical, uh, safety critical data on top of non-safety critical data on, on uh, the data between the central compute and the zone, uh, it's too much all in one step. Now, but that ultimately would be the goal to have, this is, this is sort of a long-term picture, autonomous as part of zonal architecture, but, um, but that, that would require the C, these Ethernet networks to be certainly very high uh, gigabit in speeds, and then we're also mixing safety critical data with non-safety cr critical data on the same network, and that's not something that we're gonna do in the first step. Now, some in the industry even say that, that this architecture with everything on the zone, including ADAS, is something that may, may or may not ever happen. So that's a big, a big uh, you know, question in the industry. How much is actually going to be put into the zones ultimately? And what I see working with many different large OEMs is um, every OEM has their own flavor of how they want to do zonal controllers. So it's, there isn't a sort of standard way of doing it, and a lot depends on where the OEM's coming from historically. So in the past, where, where has the OEM been with its architecture? Does it use FlexRay or CAN? That affects where it's going to move, how it's going to move towards the zonal architecture. In other words, what, what ECUs, what a functionality, what types of networks are we going to use for, for the zonal uh, architecture? But one thing is clear is that uh, zonal architectures are here to stay. So in summary, um, Every OEM that's a large OEM is moving towards zonal architecture. Reason being, uh, reduces complexity of wiring harness, reduces weight, a lot of cost, uh, improves, has the potential for improving quality as well because a lot of the quality problems of the vehicle relate to the wiring harness connectors and so forth. So the number, number of connectors that you reduce, the, the sim simplification of the wiring harness improves quality. and. Um, the, the initial zonal architectures are not going to include uh, autonomous as part of the network uh, data uh, simply because it's too, it's too risky. And um, we're going to see long term uh, what happens with autonomous control, whether it's going to be part of the zone or not. In the short term, it's definitely not going to be part of uh, zonal architectures, but zonal architectures is something all automotive engineers are going to need to know about if you're involved in automotive electronics now and uh, long term into the future. So that's my presentation. Thank you for your time.